Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our Senior College Night webinar. Um, we're excited to have you join us. Um, I am here tonight. Uh, my name is Karen Collins. I am one of the Senior Education and Career Counselors with Granite Advanced. You also may know us uh, as NEF, uh, New Hampshire Higher Education Assistance Foundation. We have a brand new name, uh, Same Us. We're all the same. We're the same nonprofit organization offering up the same things to our families. Um, but we do have a brand new name. Um, I am joined tonight by my awesome colleague, Eric Lofsted. He is going to be kind of hanging out behind the scenes and watching for questions. So we definitely want you to ask all your questions tonight. You can ask them at any point in time. You'll notice that at the bottom of your screen, you have, you may have a chat feature, maybe not, um, but you definitely have a Q&A feature. So feel free to use those. And Eric is gonna be checking them out and watching for questions. Some of them he may answer directly to you and some of them he's gonna to pose to me, make me pause, take a breath and answer those questions. So Eric, you know, definitely interrupt me at any time. Um, uh, Eric is also going to jump in and uh, offer up, you know, some advice at different points in time, things that I might have forgotten to say tonight, um, but some extra great points for all of you who are listening in. So Eric will be here with us as we move through. I am going to go to the next screen for just a second. Um, this is, as you can see, a huge QR code that you can use your smartphone. Um, just get the camera up and you can scan that. This serves kind of as our sign-in sheet for the evening. Um, because we're virtual, we're going to use this QR code. Um, we like folks to sign in um, so we know who is with us, but also because we can make sure that we send you some goodies afterwards, things like a copy of the slides. Um, we can give you a copy of some of the handouts that we normally would give to you in person if you were visiting with us. Um, so if you want to take just a second and sign in, I'm gonna pause here for just a moment. All right. If you need me to go back to that, just let Eric know and we can do that anytime. All right, here's another little uh, little QR code. We like our QR codes here at Granite Advance. Um, this QR code will actually lead you to a digital copy of what we call our Admissions Insider. This is a 20 something page booklet with all things college admissions in there. Um, so many, actually all of the things that we're gonna be talking about tonight, you're gonna find in this College Admissions Insider. This is also available on our website. So if for some reason, you're not having an easy time scanning with your phone, this is going to be available right on our website. Um, and we'll have that information up for you as well. So digital copy of our admissions insider. So now well, our uh, new website oh, graniteadvance.org. Oh, thank you, Eric. <laughs> and that and you can find that uh, insider in our uh, resource library, which is in the upper right hand corner. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric, for that. All right, let's tell you a little bit about who we are. Up on the screen now, you can see all of our shiny, smiling little faces. Um, we are eight counselors strong and our AVP Shelby right in the middle there. Um, we travel regionally. So these are the counselors in our um, in at Granite Advance. And we work um, with all of the schools in the state. We provide free information for students and for families who are uh, planning their careers and their college uh, process. And you'll notice that, you know, we do things like this. We do these statewide webinars. We are in schools where we will provide financial aid nights, college nights, um, looking at your financial aid offer nights. But you can see all of these different faces. We travel in different regions. For example, I'm in the Southern region of the state. I am in schools like Londonderry and Pinkerton and Salem and uh, Campbell and Alvern and, and those areas. Um, Eric, your location. Oh, I do basically Lakes region a little bit west of Concord and a little all the way east to the to Maine. So yeah, I'm kind of right in that central region. 
He's all in the middle and everybody, we're all in between. So um, you do have a specific counselor, but you can speak with any of us at any time. So again, we're in the schools, um, but we also have a really healthy library of some of these webinars that we have recorded um, in the past. And as we've gone through this year um, with lots of changes, so you can visit those on our website. Again, it's Granite Advance, it's E-D-V-A-N-C-E. Dot org, and you can visit that library. Um, we also work with students one-on-one. -on -one. We offer a bunch of different types of appointments that families can partake in. Um, we do virtual appointments every day of the week. Well, not every day of the week, we, every day of the work week. Um, we offer virtual appointments for families, and we also do in-person appointments in our Concord office on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you can schedule an appointment with us and you can see some um, an example of what we offer for appointments, everything from exploring careers um, and then exploring education pathways is kind of a little bit of everything. You know, I'm not really sure which colleges I wanna put on my list. How do I search? I'm not sure which colleges I might receive the most financial aid from. How do I know that? Um, you know, how, how does the application process work? Can you help me with my Common App? Those types of things kind of all fall under that education pathways, financial aid support and FAFSA prep. Um, right now, we know we're waiting on the FAFSA to open. Looks like we have a December 31st date uh, for a FAFSA open. But right now, we're offering these appointments to kind of give families a heads up on what's happening, ask all your questions, get ready for FAFSA assistance, which we will, um, we actually are able to schedule those appointments, but not until January, um, knowing that the FAFSA isn't opening quite yet. Um, but we have those appointments to help families to file FAFSA and then reviewing financial aid offers is once students have been admitted, have received their offers of aid, and then we can sit down, one of our counselors can sit down and kind of help you look at all those different offers and figure out apples to apples, what colleges are offering and what might be the best pathway. So lots of different types of appointments for families. You can see right there on the left of your screen, it says Calendly.com. That is how you can schedule online for us. It literally brings a calendar up for you. You choose your day and your time um, that happens to be available and you can schedule that appointment you can give us a call anytime as well if you're having trouble with that app. Um, All right. The people in the Go ahead. Would like the uh, sign in uh, code. Go back to the okay. sign in area. Yep, sign in real quick. Yep, I surely can. All right, there we go. There we go, everyone. Here's your sign in. Get it now, or uh, we're not putting it back. <laughs> He's teasing. We will. <laughs> For sure. There we go. All right, folks. So now we're going to go right ahead and we're going to jump in to building your college list. So one of the things that we, you know, really talk and emphasize with students when we're working with them is that this process is really all about them. Um, we as parents are going to weigh in, you know, we have an opinion of how far away or how close we might, might want our teenager to be and that could really depend on the day, depending on how they've been um, in our home that day. But we might weigh in. We might, you know, have loved our alma mater and we want our student to look at those schools. But it's really up to the student to ultimately decide what types of things they're looking for in a campus. And I think students really need to kind of think about this a little bit. Um, you know, what are those things that are most important to them? What are the non-negotiables in a campus? You know, there's so many different elements when you're choosing a college campus and, you know, everything from how far away from home it might be to um, does this campus offer classes that would best suit my learning style? You know, if I'm not a student who is going to learn really well in a lecture hall of 500 different students where I may not have the opportunity to speak with my professor or even ask questions in that class, then you might want to think about a different school, you know, so look for schools that have maybe slightly smaller class sizes and more accessibility to the to the professors. It really helps to kind of narrow some of these things down. What are those non-negotiable things that you want in a campus? Is it a sport? You know, is there a sport that your student is playing? Um, and that is really important and high on their list. You know, it, it does need to have a soccer program at a D3 level because that's what I really want to do. But also, 
your college major and also be, you know, the distance from home you want to be and the size you want it to be. So think about all of those factors when you're kind of looking at campuses and um, create these lists of schools. Um, I think I'm one, one of the other things that I noticed visiting campuses with my two children through the process is one of the things that one of them thought about more than the other was how do I recharge my batteries? You know, how am I, where, what do I do to gain that energy? For some of our students, it's like, get involved, do 150 things and go from one thing to the other all day long, right? My other, my other student, that is not it at all. She needs that time, that downtime, a space to herself, a quieter space sometimes, and then go do some more activities, but then the quieter space to recharge, 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 and then go out. Um, figure out how that campus works, you know, is that going to work for you, for, for your student, as you uh, start to visit some of these schools. So understanding the needs, sizes of classes that are going to make sense for the learning style, what is that campus culture like? I think that's really important to consider when you're visiting campuses, particularly. Um, you know, what are you noticing on the walls of the classrooms or of the walls as you walk through the classroom buildings? What's up on the walls in the residence halls? You know, are you noticing a lot of political, in, you know, involvement? Are you noticing a lot of clubs? a lot of Greek life information, is that going to suit the student? Is that the type of environment that they would best uh, do the best in? Again, athletics and clubs, um, activities, even in the surrounding area that the students might want to get involved in. Internship opportunities. You know, if a student is majoring in theater and they want to be a, a performer, they might not want to go to school in like way upstate Vermont um, where there's not that access to, you know, maybe a bigger city performing area, Boston or New York or whatever it might be. So think about those, those opportunities as well. Ways to research. Um, certainly, if your school has a particular platform like Naviance or SCORE, that's a really great place for the students to start. They can actually search out colleges, put in certain criteria, come up with a list of schools, and then they can save those schools. Um, to that platform. And then when they start applying to colleges, those schools are right there to be able to connect with the Common App. Um, for those schools that don't use Naviance or SCORE, that's okay. Um, there are uh, platforms that you can use like Big Future, which is the college board, or Peterson's, where you can do the same thing. Search on colleges by particular criteria. You want to be in New England, you want to major in chemistry, you want there to be a diving team, and you want there to be, I don't know, flag football too, um, whatever it may be. But you can put all that criteria in and come up with a list of, of uh, schools that match that particular criteria and can widen it out and narrow it in. Um, but researching is super important and the student really needs to participate in that. Um, so many times, you know, Eric and I will see a parent that might, you know, have questions for us and the student hasn't been involved that much. Or when I was a school counselor, you know, the student would come to me and say they wanted to be you know, whatever, they want to be an artist. And when the parent talked to me, that student was going to be an engineer. So it's good to talk with your student and, and be on the same page and, and help them with the process. But, um, but the student needs to be involved for sure. Other things to consider when you are looking at colleges and building that list of schools, obviously career goals are going to be really important. Is this school a place where what you may be thinking about career goal wise, where there are gonna be majors that match. And again, those internships that are gonna be available to you, you know, maybe the student wants to be a nurse and they really have a goal of working at Boston Children's Hospital. Well, it might be a good idea to look at colleges that are in that surrounding area that would offer some clinical rotations at Boston Children's Hospital, for example. Um, so you wanna make sure that those career goals align with the schools that you're looking at. That makes a lot of sense. For some of our students, they're not sure what they wanna major in just yet, and, and they're not alone. Um, undecided is one of the most, if not the most popular major um, when students are applying to college. So it's really okay. It doesn't hurt a student's chance of admission when they are going in undeclared or undecided um, because colleges really know that many 
students will change their minds once they get there. There's a lot of things they haven't even heard of yet um, in terms of what they could possibly major in or possible career directions. And once they get to college and start taking courses, they might need a professor who kind of steers them in a direction. They're really interested in what that professor has done and, and they learn of new things that they might be able to do. Um, they, there are some exceptions, certainly things like nursing, um, engineering, health sciences, where especially direct admit programs, where you are admitted directly into a nursing program, directly into a physical therapy program. Students really need to have made that decision um, when they're starting because freshman year starts right in those courses and it's a lockstep program. Um, so with few exceptions, it is okay for students to be undecided as they make their way through the process. Um, accessibility services and academic support so I think all students should be interested in what type of academic support is offered at their at the colleges they're looking at. Um, a lot of times my really strong students were not really thinking of this because they don't generally seek academic support. They've done fine through middle school, high school. But the smartest students on a college campus will seek academic support. They'll go to the writing center when they're writing that first uh, essay for their freshman professor, and they really have no idea what this professor is looking for. They can go to places like the writing center and sit down with an upperclassman who might have even had that professor and get some pointers like, hey, this professor is a big stickler for MLA. You want to make sure that you are following all those rules. And, you know, this kind of thing is what they're looking for. So it really helps um, to have that support when you're on a college campus. So every student can seek academic support, whether that's from the professor's office hours or whether it's through the academic support office where there generally is free tutoring offered for those subjects, which might be more challenging for students, you know, wherever that might be. Um, so do check that out and, and do, you know, get information about that. Um, accessibility services are for students that might have an IEP or a 504 um, in high school. And they will meet with the, act, the uh, accessibility services office generally after acceptance. So you don't have to declare that you, know, you have um, any type of a disability when you're applying to college, but you will meet with that office afterwards and they can help you to put together a plan for accommodations for you while you're in college. Maybe you need to sit at the front of the classroom or you need to um, have notes taken or you need extended time on exams. And that's something you can do. And I see, and I apologize, I see a typo on our screen. I didn't catch one of the neef.orgs that is now Granite Advance, E D V A N C E dot org. I apologize. I'll get that changed before we send any uh, any slides out to you. Um, but I did miss that one today. Sorry about that. But um, but there is what we call the the Accessibility Insider right on our website, and you can get more information about that process. There's a very specific process students will go through. Um, also true if a student has a mobility issue. Um, health concerns, you know, whatever it may be, and you need some accommodations for that as well. So don't, you know, don't leave that out of your process. Check and make sure that that school might be one that is going to be able to accommodate your needs when you get to college. Getting to know the schools. This is very important. Obviously, if a student is going to spend two, four, some of our students are going to spend six years on these college campuses, they want to know a little bit more about um, what they might be getting into. For students um, who are earlier in the process, attending college fairs and doing high school and attending the high school visits is a great way to get to know a little bit about the school without having to make a trip to campus. Um, a college fair is a great way for a student to kind of be just shopping. You know, they can walk around at this big fair with colleges that have set up their tables and they can walk through and get some information about many, many colleges that night. A lot of times they have what uh, interest card, you know, that they ask the students to fill out while they're standing at their table. Um, that is by no means a commission that that, that admission counselor is going to get by bringing many of them back to the office. But what it does do is you, it certainly gets you on their mailing list and you'll get more, more emails and, and more mail. Yes, definitely. But it also puts you on their radar um, and they will count that as a contact with the student. Some schools look at what they call demonstrated interest um, in a campus. And by that, they're looking for the student's interest in their school. 
you know, are they really interested in coming to this school? Did they make contact with us prior to applying? Uh, a college fair is one way that you demonstrate that interest because you're talking probably to the rep who is going to read the student's file. Admissions rep uh, travel in um, territories and they will go to college fairs and high school visits within their own territory and they'd be the ones reading those uh, school's files. So high school visits happen at your own individual school. Um, generally, there is a schedule in the school counseling office or sometimes on Naviance or SCORE. You can see that schedule of colleges that are going to be visiting your high school. You sign up to go and visit with that rep. Again, that is the rep that is going to read your admission file. So it's a great way to get to know more about that school and for that rep to have an opportunity to meet the student as well. So take advantage of those times. Again, way to demonstrate interest. It's a way to make contact with that representative from the school. Campus visits are another thing that if you're able um, are a really good part of this process. So going to the actual school and um, walking around campus, having a tour, um, whether it's an athletic event, maybe that you're just going to a hockey game. Well, notice the campus while you're there. You know, is it too big? Is it small? Is it too much in the city? Not enough in the city? You know, what is it about that school that you loved um, or didn't love, you know, that you can learn from as, as you're doing that? Information sessions and tours are a really great way to know more. So information sessions, typically like a half an hour little presentation by the admission office, and then they'll take you, students will take you out on tour of the campus. Um, again, great way to connect with admissions, great way to, to have a tour with a student from that particular school. Open houses are a big event um, where students can get a lot of information in a really short amount of time. So not only can you get tours, but you can often meet with professors. Sometimes you'll be sorted by your particular intended major and you'll go and hear, you know, maybe a 15, 20 minute session with the professors or the dean from that particular department who will tell you more about what students study in that area. Um, you can visit with, sometimes they'll set up like a little fair of different event or different activities that you can do on campus. So maybe the such and such club and the uh, club sports teams and all of that, you might be able to, to meet with some of those folks as well. So an open house is a, is a little bit larger event that you'll see more students, you know, sometimes a great number of students and families on campus that day as well. So whichever one suits your student um, better, take advantage of those as well. Um, social media is another piece that we're always telling students, get off your phones, get off your phones, get off your phones. But in this case, we'll let them be on their phones. Um, follow the college on social media, follow whichever areas of college that you're interested in. You know, if you are a field hockey player, follow their field hockey team. If you are interested in their outdoor club, follow the outdoor club, you know, follow the, the admissions office, follow the dining hall. You get lots of information about the school by just following their social media. You'll see what they're posting. You'll see a lot of times it's short videos of students talking, um, does that sound like a place you want to be, you know, get, get a chance to kind of study the culture of the school and also be following them, um, you know, as another demonstration of interest. So really good idea to, uh, you know, to do some of these things to really get to know the schools as you're putting together that final list. When you create that list of colleges, so now maybe, you know, you've done your research, you have visited some campuses or at least visited with some of the reps from the campuses. Now you need to put together the list of colleges. And this is kind of where our seniors are right now, many of them. Um, some of them have applied to some of their schools. Some of them are still in the process of applying. Wherever you are right now, um, these are the things to think about. We definitely want students to think about a really balanced list of colleges on their when they put together that final list. You don't want to apply to just one type of school because then that's just one type of admission offer that you're seeking and it's just one type of financial aid potentially that's being offered. Um, so you want to balance that list with, we call them the probable, target, and reach schools. So the probable schools are those schools where our students exceed the expectation for admission by a significant amount. So if that college is looking for students with a 3.0, you know, you're a 3.3 and above, you know, you exceed those by a good margin um, and it's a school that you're likely to be admitted to. 
target schools are schools where you kind of fit that profile of a typical uh, student that's being admitted to the campus. So if they are looking for a 3.0 student, that's their average, you know, admitted student and their test scores, if they require them or X, Y, Z, and you're kind of right in there, that's a target school for you. So it's likely that you'll be admitted, but this is college admissions. So there's never a guarantee. Um, you know, we can never guarantee admission for any one student, but it's a good chance that a student would be admitted at a target school. Reach schools are those schools where you don't fit that profile, you know, maybe your grades are, are lower than what their middle 50%, you know, of admitted students have, or maybe the test scores are lower. Um, typically not both because that's a double reach school and that makes it even harder to get into for a student. But that reach school is just one that you would really love to go to and you don't know, you never know exactly what the college is looking for that year. So you wanna put it out there. Um, so you just have to balance that list so that you have, you balance the opportunities for admission. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, financial aid as well. Think about what is a safety Can school. Real quick. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Uh, other thing about REIT schools, some stuff that, you know, think about it is that there are some schools out there, highly competitive schools that have very low acceptance rates just because they have 50,000 kids apply and they have 3,000 spots. So there's just, there's some schools that are like almost automatic REIT schools for everybody, even if you could, you know, totally exceed what they usually have. Sometimes those schools just kind of keep that in mind. And then there's also those financial reach schools where uh, if they give you a great package, you can go there. Uh, but if not, it's going to be too expensive and like out of your price range. So I always kind of look at like, and we'll talk about financial aid, but, you know, it's definitely always worth it to apply, but then have that in the back of your head of, well, if it, I don't get enough aid, then probably not a good uh, good fit. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks, Eric. That is very true. There are schools are highly, you know, the Ivy League colleges and some of the highly, you know, selective schools that it, they're just reach schools for everyone. You know, you can have a perfect GPA and, and perfect test scores and it's still a reach school because there are a lot of students with that, unfortunately, and that that are able to, you know, produce scores like that. Um, and there's just not as many spots in a class as there are really amazing students out there for sure. One of the things that we talk about a lot is that safety school, you need to kind of think about that carefully and you need to um, make sure that it's a safety really for the individual student. You know, what's a safety school for one student may not be a safety school for another student. And I think we as parents, you know, we went to college in a different time. So certain schools here in our state were always kind of the safety schools. And we just assume that that's the same thing for our students. And it really isn't. Um, some of our state universities um, really have high average GPAs. You know, U University of New Hampshire is a 3.4, 3.5 average GPA. So we want to make sure that we're defining safety school um, really well for our individual student. You know, so for a student with a 2.0, the University of New Hampshire is not a safety school for them. So we want to make sure that we're really defining what does that safety school mean and what does it mean for my particular student. Um, so that's a little tricky too. And that's something that the school counselors can really help students with. It's something that on Naviance, um, if you have it, there they a lot of them have scattergrams where um, students, previous students have applied to that same school that your student might be looking at. And based on, and you'll see where they fell in the admissions pool, you know, based on this GPA and these task scores, this student did or didn't get in. So you can kind of see that. Also on Naviance, I don't know score as well, but on Naviance, there's a space where <clears throat> students can see, it kind of really delineates it for the student. You know, these, this is where your test scores, test scores fall. This is where your, your average high school test scores fall. And this is where national test scores and grade point averages fell in, you know, where are you? Are you above, below, in between? So it really kind of shows you whether that school might be a safety or reach or a target school. So um, use all your resources. We're here too. You know, we, this is something that we can definitely talk with students about. Um, but, you know, just really na nailing down that list so that you have a variety of schools on there is really important. I also tell students all the time, and my student is a senior this year, so I see lots of students in my home right now talking about their list of colleges that they're applying to, 
if the student can't name two or three very specific reasons they're applying to a school, it doesn't need to be on their list. You don't need to apply to 20 colleges um, just because they sent you a free um, application fee. You know, you don't need to apply to those schools or you don't need to apply just to see if you got in. You don't necessarily want to take a spot away from another student um, just because you wanted to see. So 20 is not necessary, um, particularly for most majors, it's not necessary. Um, you know, maybe keeping it a little bit narrower than that is, is going to be great. Obviously, we want to consider the major. Does the school have the major that the student wants to study? Very important to check on. And then financial aid, as Eric and I were mentioning, um, when you are creating your list of school, you don't need to be filling out financial aid forms at that point in time, but you do want to consider how the individual college offers their aid. So colleges have their own pool of money that they can offer to students. And some colleges have a really big pool of money that they can offer. And that is probably where the majority of your money is gonna come from um, to help fund that education. So you wanna know how they're choosing to offer it. So one college may say, hey, you know what? We're gonna offer our money to students based on merit. So based on something they have done well and probably 98 times out of 90, you know, 100, that's gonna be based on academic merit. That comes through the admission process. The admission counselors assign that merit, you know, when, student, when that comes through and that's what the college has chosen to do. Other schools say, we're not offering any merit scholarship. That's not something we're going to do. We're gonna offer need-based aid instead. So that is based on family finances and it has nothing to do with how well the student did academically. Some schools do both. You know, they have a little bit of both. You might get some need-based aid and some merit-based aid. But if you know you kind of fall into one of those categories, you're a really strong student and you really want that merit-based aid, you know, you're looking for that merit-based, academic merit-based aid, then you need to apply to colleges that offer that. And you also, need to be sure that that college that you're applying to is not necessarily a REACH college. Because if you have a list full of REACH colleges, those are not schools where you're going to receive academic merit scholarship, even if they offer it necessarily. Because if it's a REACH for you, you're not the strongest candidate in the pool. So it means that that money is probably not gonna be offered to you. So you really wanna, that comes back to that balance of the list, where you're gonna get the most merit-based aid is at a target for a safety school, more so at a safety school. So just be aware of that and kind of use what you've got, whether that's grades or whether that's need-based aid or a combination of both, and make sure that the colleges offer that up so that you have the best chance at getting the most money to help you fund your education. And sometimes they're gonna come through and you're gonna get that, you know, you're gonna, as Eric said, it's gonna be like, great, we can afford that institution. And sometimes it won't, you know, it's just not enough that's why we have multiple schools on our list. And that's why we have multiple different types of schools on the list as well. So just thinking about that as you move forward, definitely going to be important. Eric, how are we doing with questions? Anything? We're doing good. Uh, answer them as we go. They're asking about the scattergrams. Both Naviance and SCORE have scattergrams. So uh, I looked that up real quick. So yeah, they both yeah. do. So you can look uh, if your school has either of those programs. Um, and then like you can always find some some of that information just on Google searches if exactly. you, your school does not uh, have those. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. So once we put that list of colleges together, the next step obviously is to apply. And this is where many of our seniors are right now. So let's talk a little bit about how and when students can apply. Different colleges have different options for students um, as to how they'll submit their applications. And I'm actually going to work my way from the bottom up of this list, um, starting with the most restrictive type of admission and moving to um, a different policy that's a little bit less restrictive. Um, early decision is one way that a student can apply to some of the schools. Not every school has early decision, but many do. This is generally something that happens earlier in the process, usually between October and December of the student's senior year. So their date for early decision will be early. Students will hear back early from that institution, whether they've been admitted or not. Um, but with early decision, it is a binding contract. So the student, the parent, and the school counselor all sign 
um, a contract saying that if the student is admitted, the student agrees to enroll in that particular at that particular school. They have to at that point in time withdraw their other applications for admission, and um, you know declare their decision to attend that particular school. So this is not for everyone. This is for some students who know definitively that this is the school for them. Some students will apply early decision at that school that is a dream school. Um, so one where um, maybe they're not as strong a candidate and the early decision pool is where the school might admit the majority of their students. Some students will apply early decision and see if that helps their admission process. But again, this is definitely not for everyone. And it's certainly not for families that are looking to compare financial aid offered between different colleges, because this once you get this, you withdraw your other applications and you're not going to see financial aid from those schools. You're gonna see one offer from this school and that's what it is. Now, if that offer is not similar to what, um, you know, there's something called a net price calculator and it's on the financial aid page of every college, you can put in financial information about the family and it will estimate what an offer might look like for you at that school. If you run that net price calculator and you very much should, especially in an early decision situation, if you run that net price calculator, screenshot it, and it looks like it's gonna be affordable for your family, but the financial aid offer comes back very different from that. That is your one way of being able to get out of that contract um, from an early decision school. So if you cannot financially pay for what you thought you were paying for, you know, on that net price calculator, that is something that you can talk with a college about. Hopefully they can make it better for you. But if not, that is the one way um, students can get out of that. Early action is similar. You apply early, you hear back early from the college, but this is a non-binding contract. So students have the opportunity to keep all of their other applications for admission in not make a decision before May 1st for an early action school and receive all of their financial aid offers, make comparisons, revisit, do all the things, and then make a choice. So early action is for students who really um, want to get started early in the process, want to hear early in that process, want a little bit more time to make a decision, and have the grades that at the end of their junior year that they feel really strong about. So if this is their best presentation, they feel really strong about their grades, they don't need the college to necessarily see their senior grades, early action might be for our students. Regular decision is a fixed deadline, usually somewhere between November, but usually more December into March, where students, you know, whatever that date is, March 1st, you get all of your materials into the college. Again, this is a non-binding contract with the school. Students are able to hear from other schools, um, review everything that they've received and make a final decision. This might be for students who either are getting started a little bit later in the process, maybe they were just thinking about college, they weren't make, really sure, or maybe they just want to take their time and really solidify their list of schools, or perhaps they also want their senior grades because those are super strong and they're taking really solid courses. They want those to be viewed by the college. Then regular decision is a really good choice for our students as well. Students might do a mix of these. You know, Students might apply early action to some of their schools and then regular decision to some of their other schools because they want that time. And that is perfectly fine. Rolling admission is really, um, there's no fixed deadline as to when that, that application has to be in. In fact, some students started applying in August to colleges and have started hearing back from the schools. Um, but it also students can apply later. There are some schools that have like an early action deadline and then they become rolling admissions after that early action deadline has passed. Students can keep applying and then it becomes rolling admission where you know, as soon as that student gets their full application in, then the college will start reviewing and they'll get an answer back to the student. Sometimes it's quick as a couple of weeks and sometimes it's longer than that, but rolling admission keeps rolling until the class is filled. So you don't want to wait too, too long for a rolling admission school because you can, you know, it can become filled and then there's not a space for that student. So you just have to be careful about that. Um, but rolling admission works really well for a lot of our students as well. And again, 
colleges may offer a bunch of these different opportunities. You may see, you know, you know, a couple of these offered for the schools you're interested in. You choose the one that is best for you. Oops, let me get that going here, sorry. So the pieces of the college application um, besides their actual application, which most of our students are using the common application um, for their colleges. The common application is an online form that the students can complete. There are about 900, it's actually more than 900 colleges that will use and accept the common application. Students fill it out one time, they name the colleges that they're looking at, and then there's some additional questions from each of the colleges, they fill that out, and then they're able to send that to multiple schools. You don't have to do it all at once. You can do it as you go. You can do it all at once. You can do it however you wish, but you can use the common application for up to 20 schools. Um, once you hit that mark, hopefully nobody's hitting too much above that mark, but if you are, you will need to use the school specific application. So if your student does have more than 20 schools, you wanna check which colleges actually have a school specific application and then make the choice as to which ones you can apply to through that way and then which ones you will need to use Common App because once you hit 20 schools, you can no longer use the Common App. Um, so along with that Common App, colleges are gonna require the high school transcript. This is going to be sent directly from your high school. They will let you know exactly how that works for those schools with Naviant and score, it connects directly. Um, so once students apply to a school, the counselor gets notification, the high school transcript is sent to the college, um, along with letters of recommendation, um, and, um, the letter of recommendation from the school counselor. So the high school transcript, uh, number one, most important piece of information for every college. This tells your four-year picture of how you've done academically. So, um, grades from grade nine all the way through grade 12, if you have them, depending on the time that you apply, um, and that all of that information will be there for the colleges. With your high school transcript, the school will also send a profile, which is kind of like the answer key <laughs> to the high school transcript. So it gives all the information about your school. So is your grading system 90 to 100 is an A, or 93 to 100 is an A? Do you use letters? Do you use numbers? Um, how many AP courses are offered at your high school? How many honors courses are offered at your high school? Is the, do you use class rank? Is the class rank weighted or unweighted? Do they give extra points for taking honors courses or AP courses or dual enrolled courses? How does that work? All of that information is in that profile for the colleges to use when they're reviewing the applicant's file. And believe me, I was in admissions for many years you absolutely use that profile. Um, you typically get to know the schools that are in your territory very well. So sometimes, you know, you know the school really well and you don't have to necessarily, but you do always check that to make sure nothing has changed at the high school. You're also gonna have a college essay for the majority of colleges require the college essay. There are seven prompts on the common application for the students to choose, but the most common one is select a topic of your choice. Um, that way the students can write about kind of whatever they would like to, but that essay is very important. We definitely want students to be spending time on that essay. Do not write this at 11.45 with a 11.59 deadline because that will show, you know, in that process. And that's not a good start um, for the college. So we want you to make sure that you spend some time with it, move away from it, have a teacher read it, have your parent read it, um, have us read it. We will help students with that as well. I read essays probably most days um, that I'm in the office. So students are sending those over to me happy to do that for your student as well. So college essays, definitely something that is super important. Um, and choose a topic that you love. Um, don't write what you think the admission counselor wants to hear, because honestly, we don't. Um, I know you think that maybe you know what they want to hear. You know, it should be very highly intellectual. It should be about my major. It should be about this thing. Not really. It should really be um, how you talk, you know, how do you normally speak? Do you use words that you find in the thesaurus in a normal conversation? If not, skip them in the essay to um, write about something that you're really passionate about. And that comes through then to your reader and it makes a much better essay for sure. Extracurricular activities are very important, but it is quality over quantity. So don't feel the need to fill out every one of those 10 
sections that you can complete with an activity. If you can, great. But if you don't, that's okay too. Um, just be careful about, you know, I would say, make sure you put the one that you love the most first and then so on down your list. Um, make sure to give yourself some props for the things that you've done instead of writing about what that activity is, write about what you did in that activity. So we know what National Honor Society is, right? But what did you do at National Honor Society? Did you have a particular um, community service project that you did? write about that, you know, put that information in there. Letters of recommendation, some colleges require them. Other colleges, it's optional. Um, so you'll notice that there's a spot for a school counselor. Um, so typically your school counselor will write one letter of recommendation for you. And then for most students, having two teacher recommendation is going to be enough um, for most of the colleges. I don't think I've seen one require more than three, um, but I could be wrong. So just be aware, like have those two teacher letters of recommendation available to you. You can have recommendations from other folks like a clergy member or a mentor or your coach, something like that, but never replace an academic letter with one of those. You know, you always want to get those academic letters in there and then you can have those other letters of recommendation for the colleges because they really you know, their job is to admit you to be a student. So that is most important to them that they, they get information about how you are as a student. SAT or ACT scores, you've noticed that many, 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 many colleges are test optional or test blind. Um, test optional means that the student has the choice as to whether they want to submit test scores or not. Test blind means that even if you want to submit your test scores, you cannot, they're not gonna consider them. So just be aware that for the most part, students are going to have the choice as to whether they wanna submit these scores or not. Here's where a little research really pays off. You know, If the um, middle 50% of students have test scores between 1200 and 1300, and your test scores are 1400, you go right ahead and you submit those scores, right? Because that's gonna help you. But if your scores are 1,000 and it's between 1,200 and 1,300, that's not going to help your case. That puts you in the lower 25th percentile. Don't submit them. Be test optional and just show off your grades. It's okay if you do that. And colleges don't penalize students for that. So test scores, if they say optional, truly optional. And you can always email an admission counselor. If you have questions about that, you can send up, shoot us an email. You can ask your school counselor, do you think I should submit or not? Um, and we can help you with that as well. There's so lots of, for that, oh, go uh, ahead, Eric. Please say the website for that's fairtest.org. Uh, oh, yes. Fairtest.org. If you look at fairtest.org, there's a listing of all the schools that are test optional and all the schools that are test blind. So if you're a student who just isn't a great test taker, same, um, you can look at that list and say, great, they do not require or they do not even take test scores. Those are some schools I want to take a peek at. So yeah. the list is extensive. So definitely check that out. Thanks, Eric. That's perfect. Yeah. And just on uh, extracurriculars, don't forget if you have a job that is considered an extracurricular. A lot of people are like, oh, I work. I don't have extracurriculars. Well, you work. That is your extracurricular. So yeah. don't forget to put that down. Yeah, and absolutely. And also for students that have family responsibilities, some of you may be, you know, maybe you have younger siblings and your job after school is to go home, get them off the bus, get homework started, get dinner started before your parents get home from school, or you are the taxi cab, you drive them around to their sports. So you don't have time to do your sports because you're busy driving your, your siblings around. That is also considered an extracurricular activity, um, very responsible extracurricular activity. So be, be sure to give yourself credit for all the things that you do um, as you go through that extracurricular section. If you need help with that, again, school counselor, and we're here to help you um, think of some of the things that you do that you don't think you do as you move through. Other things that some of our students need to consider, auditions, if students are performing artists, if they're going to go into dance, theater, 
music, they might need to do auditions for that. So be aware of that and leave time in your schedule. Typically they happen anytime from um, the beginning of senior year all the way really through January or February. So just kind of make sure you get that in your schedule and you know when those auditions are. A lot of times there's money attached to that. So there are merit scholarships for students when they do these auditions. So you do want to make sure that you do them so that you can be admitted directly into your program and have the opportunity for some money. Portfolios are for students who are um, in the arts. So in fine arts or uh, architecture, a lot of times the schools will require a portfolio. All of that uh, mission, all of that information will be up on the website of the college and certainly contact them with any questions that you might have. But portfolios are out there. There are portfolio days and portfolio events that can help students to put together that digital portfolio. Um, so definitely take advantage of that and, and take a peek if that's something that you need help with. Um, a lot of times the art teachers at your high school also really know about that and can help you to determine which pieces to put in your portfolio and all of that. Um, we won't pretend that we can do that. I am no artist, but uh, we can steer you in the direction of who to, who to talk to for portfolios. Um, our athletes are going to need to be registered with the NCAA Eligibility Center if they want to play a Division I or a Division II sport. Division three athletes can also register. You don't have to, but you can register and, and create an account because you may not know. You may think you, you, know, you want to play, but you don't know if you're going to be a D2 or a D3 or a D1, D2, D3. Um, but students generally uh, will register with the Eligibility Center sometime in their junior year so that they are able um, when the time comes to talk with coaches who might be interested in speaking with them. So um, the eligibility center asks for transcripts and um, actually they no longer ask for test scores, but the transcripts to make sure the students take the coursework that's required in order to be eligible to play um, at a collegiate level. So do check that out. Any questions? There's a big website you can see there um, with all the information about um, playing at that level. Supplemental essays, some colleges will have you write the main essay, which is part of the common app section um, of the common app, or I guess the common section of the common app, but other co but colleges may have their own supplemental essays that they also want. Could be as many as 250 words. It could be as many as 600 words, but they have their own questions that they also want to ask to students. So just be aware of that and don't leave everything to the last minute so that you haven't even looked at the questions from the individual colleges and think that you're going to do them really quick and submit because they may have three or four supplemental essays that you want to spend time on um, because they're just as important, if not more important than the Common App essay. So do be aware of that. Even if it's 250 words, you want to spend those words well. Um, you want to make sure the grammar, the spelling, and the content are all on key so that you're you're looking great when uh, when you go through. But these are some of the things that you can talk to an admissions representative about, you know, when you're at a college fair, when you're visiting the campus. Um, you can send an email to that admissions rep. You'll notice on the college website that typically they'll say meet our counselors and they'll say what territory they travel in. So if they're in New Hampshire, you know, they travel in New Hampshire, you can click on them and get their email and ask them your questions for sure. Eric, I saw questions come in. Do we, do I need to pause? Yeah, we got, yeah, we got a couple and they're all about uh, test scores. So okay. the first one um, is, are schools in New Hampshire looking or, or requiring test scores to award merit? If you do not submit, does that mean you will not be considered for merit? Great question. So the answer is it depends, which is a, the worst answer I can possibly give you, but it does. So it's school specific. So for the most part, if they are test optional, chances are that they're test optional for merit as well. Um, the schools that require test scores for merit generally say that on their website. So yes, they may be test optional, but they require you to submit test scores in order to be eligible for merit. That should be right on their admission website. If you're not seeing it one way or another and you just want to make sure you've got yourself covered, send a quick email to the admission office. Actually, have your student send a quick email to the admission office and ask that question. They will absolutely tell you what that, what that answer will be. But unfortunately, it does depend on which school. For the most part, if it's optional, it's optional. Great. Right. Question. Yeah, and now the uh, second question uh, basically says, is that a uh, student sent scores, but his scores were average to schools that may have been test optional. 
since he sent the scores, are they going to be automatically considered and look at? Super question. So this happens sometimes when the students take the tests at the schools or the test center proctor will say, hey, students, there's four free test scores. Name four colleges to send your, you know, your test scores to. And your students are like, great, sounds fab. Let me send it to Harvard and this place and that, you know, let me send them. And then they're like, ooh, I didn't love those test scores. What do I do now? So when you send them, that's fine. The colleges kind of hang on to them. But on the Common App, you have the chance to say whether you want your test scores considered or not. Typically, if you say, I do not want my test scores considered, the college will not consider them, even if you've submitted them. Um, have they seen them? Possibly. Um, will they see them? Possibly. But if you say you don't want them considered, they will not consider them as part of that process. Yep. Yeah, so the basic answer on that is uh, if he sent them away on the Common App just before he applies to say, I don't want to consider them, and that would be the way. And other than that, uh, talk to admissions and see uh, if anything can be done. Yeah, and generally speaking, it can. You know, for most colleges, they're, you know, if they're a test, they have a test optional policy, and you send them early, not knowing they're going to work with you and they're going to work with your students. So just reach out if you had sent them and there's, you know, you've already sent Common App also, you know, reach out to the schools and say, oh, I don't know. Let me, can I talk to you about this? It's not my best. My grades are much more representative of who I am as a student. Um, and the college will, you know, can work with you on that. But that is a great question for sure. All right, and this leads me right into this perfectly, this slide. Um, in this process, students really need to take the lead. So once students are in that senior year, especially, um, correspondence should come from the students themselves. So I read or read admission files for Northeastern and Oftentimes in my notes, because when the files come over to me, they're all electronic. And in the notes, I'll see mom called to check on student status. Mom called to tell us about another award the student received. Mom called, and it does say mom called. So we don't really want that <laughs> in the files because this is your student. As much as we might like to go with our students and be their roommates in college, our students don't want that and the colleges don't let us. So it's time for the students to kind of take over the process and really be the ones to email admissions, to set up their um, tours, to um, you know talk to the college admission reps when you go up to the table at the college fair. It's hard because I have a very quiet child. So I get the, when she's very quiet and standing there and I'm like, say something, I wanna say something, but resist. Um, let your student do it because they're the ones going to college and the colleges appreciate talking to your students for sure. So students jump in, take over this process, make sure, you know, that everything that's going out has come from you, which is really a great idea. Um, be aware of your social media. Also, students, um, colleges can very much look at your social media and have and have uninvited students to be part of their incoming freshman class for inappropriate social media. So we don't want to be those students. We want to have appropriate social media and the colleges, if they are checking to say, wow, this is a great student, we want them coming into our campus and joining us and, and continuing their appropriate activity. So just be aware of your social media as you move into that you know, junior, senior year for sure. Um, the other thing that we encourage students to do is to create an email that they use specifically for college. There is so much email coming into these students. Um, you want to have this one email that you're using when you're applying to colleges. Don't ever use your, your school email um, because you lose that after you graduate. So you don't want anything, you know, attached to your school email because you're gonna continue for four years at your college. So create an appropriate email, you know, first name, last name, graduation year at Gmail, you know, what? very simple. Parents, the funniest part, like we always say, you know, create this professional email, don't use like biker kid and this thing and that thing. But really where we see those emails is from the parents because we've created our email address long ago, right? And we're not changing it. So um, a lot of times we see the funniest emails that are parent emails, not students. So students are pretty good, but um, but students have your own email so that you don't, so that you can find the things that are coming from your college and it's not all your coursework and all of that stuff. 
Um, another thing that I think is really important for our students to do is really to continue to be in communication with not only your parents, because your parents should understand, you know, what your plan is, and you should understand what your parents are thinking in this process. But also, you want to be in touch with your school counseling office, what are the dates, what are the things I need to know about the process at my high school, do I need to fill in a paper asking for transcript, is it automatic, how does this work, what do I need to do, do I have a brag sheet I need to fill out for my recommenders, you know, what does my high school require, be in touch with your counseling office, also be in touch with them for scholarship information for our seniors. That process will really probably start at your high school around February. Be aware of that. The counselors, we're going to be talking about it. Um, and students, you know, again, are the ones that are corresponding with the college admissions. Sometimes parents are the ones talking with financial aid because the questions are a little bit more than what our students would know to ask, and that's okay. But, um, but for the most part, our students should be the ones communicating. And students, Find a way to stay organized. Whatever your method is, is fine. It doesn't have to be, you know, color-coded files in a drawer and all of that. It can be however you like to stay organized, but maybe make a spreadsheet so you know when all of your applications are going to be due. They're all different from different schools. Also, when are the financial aid deadlines from your particular schools? When are these schools going to get back to you with a, you know, with an answer? Because as soon as you send press submit, you're like, okay, when are they going to get back to me? So know that when they're going to get back to you and don't get crazy because they haven't yet, because that's not when they're going to get back to you. Keep all of that information in a way that makes sense to you. Always check your portals. Um, colleges will invite students to set up a portal. Once they've applied for admission, they send an email to that student and they say, here's your username and your temporary password please set up your portal. And then they communicate with the student in that portal. Students can go in and check the status of their application. Are you missing a letter of recommendation? Are you missing my transcript? They can check that. So portals are key. Students should be checking them regularly um, because that might be where they're getting their acceptances too. So keep an eye on, on the portal as you move through. All right, couple quick hints um, before we let you go for the evening. Um, always start this process as early as you can. Um, it's a long process. You know, it's something that um, you want to spend some time on. It's a, it's a big investment, big financial investment, big time investment by the student and the parent. Um, so start the process early. You know, it's, it's never too early to drive through a college campus if you happen to be visiting a particular area on vacation. Um, it's never too early to ask questions about the process. What classes should I be taking if I want to be a nurse? What classes sh should I be taking for engineering? Do I need calculus? Do I not need calculus? So start the process early. Um, students, again, need to be organized in some way, some form, whatever way that is for you that works best. Um, you know, make sure that you're doing that and checking your deadlines. Knowing what's required is going to also be re really important. Um, that's something that a lot of students will put right into their spreadsheet. You know, do they require test scores? Can they be optional? How many letters of recommendation do they require? Are there optional? Is there, you know, an opportunity to send optional letters of recommendation? Which essays are they asking for? When are those due? So be, you know, be sure that you have all that information handy. Um, I think, again, being consistent, this is a tricky one for students because now we're telling you to have this email address um, created for your college stuff. If you've already, if you already have colleges contacting you at a different email address, that's fine. You can just email the admissions office and say, hey, I was using my school email address prior this is still me. I still want credit for having talked to you. Um, but here's my new email address that I'm going to be using for my college applications. Super easy. They connect them in their office and, and it is fine. It takes them two minutes and they say, you're all set. Um, but do let them know about that. Be consistent. Um, also be consistent about your mailing address. Don't, you know, use one address and then another address. Um, you know, try to be consistent with all of those things so that they can find you and, and send you the information. Um, the other thing that, you know, you can definitely do is attend a financial aid night. We are actually having a financial aid webinar tomorrow evening. Um, that information is right up on our Granite Advance website. So you can sign up right up until the time, well, even when it gets started, you can sign register for that as well. Um, Cam is going to be doing that one for you. Um, but you can also, I think we have some recorded up there. We'll put these new recordings up on our website as well, you know, so get some information about the FAFSA coming up. And then 
this year, because the FAFSA is delayed for our seniors, we, we know that, um, you know, it's not out yet. Typically for our seniors, that is open on October the 1st this year, because there is a new FAFSA. They call it the better FAFSA. Um, it is opening a little bit later. So the date that we have been given is December the 31st. So mark your calendars. Um, although I wouldn't necessarily do it on that date because it's going to get crazy. Um, and let the folks go through and work out the bugs for a few days and then and then maybe give yourself to the new year to get started on that. But the one thing that you can do now is create what's called an FSA ID um, for the student. Well, a student will create one for themselves and parents will need one as well. So if you are married and you file jointly, only one parent will need to have an FSA ID. If you are married and you file separately or you are singled, widowed, divorced, uh, separated, you will potentially need two depending on the family structure. And again, we can help you with that if you have questions about that. But setting up an FSA ID now um, will help the process. It's gonna take uh, several days for it to go through all the verifications through the Social Security Administration. So having that ready to go when you're ready to start filing is going to be helpful for you. So that you can see on the screen, this is kind of what it looks like. You're just gonna to go to the FAFSA website, um, which is studentaid.gov. And maybe Eric will stick that up in the chat there for you, or one of those places, studentaid.gov, and then you create an account. If you are a parent who has an FSA ID for an older child, you're all set. You don't need to create a new one. So you already have one. Um, but if it this is new, this is your first student going through, um, the parent will need to have that as well. And again, join Cam tomorrow. He's going to go into much more detail. I don't want to bog you down with that tonight, but that is something that you can really start to think about. Last thing is, is if you have any questions at any point, and, and I'll check, I know there's some questions up there now, um, you can call us at any time. Um, that is our direct line that you see up there on the screen. You can send us an email. You can schedule an appointment with us. Um, any which way that you want to contact us, it is available. Any questions you might have, um, let us know. We are all available to you. Um, we will be filing FAFSA starting, what date, Eric? The 4th? Third? Third, uh, third or fourth. Yeah. yeah, January 3rd or 4th. So you can schedule appointments for the FAFSA now that we know when it's actually opening. We've opened our calendars for that as well. Um, so we will, you know, we'll be able to get those started for you as well. Most colleges, it looks like, are going to have later deadlines um, into February. For most colleges will not receive your FAFSA information until the end of January. Even if we file January 3rd, they are not gonna actually receive that information until the end of January. So it's not a panic. We don't have to file on the 3rd. If you can't get an appointment, don't worry, it's okay. Um, we're gonna be there all through January helping families to file for sure. And then the last QR code, we love the QR codes. Um, the last one that we have up there is actually our um, evaluation and we would appreciate if you want to take a minute to give us some feedback let Eric and I know what we could do to make this more helpful for students we definitely live for our feedback so that we can uh, make things better and more accessible for as many families as possible and Eric I see questions coming in so happy to answer any yep so the first one is and I can answer this do parents and students each have their own FSA IDs absolutely 100 percent both parents and students uh, to give you guys a quick kind of hint of what's upcoming. The student's going to have a part to do. Parents, you are going to have a part to do. Those parts are very separate, and you're going to need to log in separately for those. Um, so, yeah, so both of you are going to need an ID. And then the other question is, on tomorrow night, are we going to discuss or answer questions on the CSS profile? So there will be some talk about the CSS profile for sure. Um not as much as the FAFSA, <laughs> definitely, but yes, CSS profile is a whole different beast. Lots more questions, um, you know, where the FAFSA is probably about 36 questions at most for families. CSS is more like 300. So there's a lot more information that families are going to need for CSS profile. Cam will definitely walk you through what some of that information might be, um, how to go about, you know, registering for CSS profile, what that's going to look like. Um, but it might be a situation where you're going to get more FAFSA information than you are CSS. Not everyone, CSS profile is a second 
um, for those of you who aren't sure what that is, FAFSA is the main financial aid um, form that you're going to need to file. So regardless of what type of school you're looking at, they're going to want the FAFSA. Two-year, four-year, public, private, in-state, out-of-state. Everybody wants FAFSA. That's the federal form. CSS profiles an institutional form, and some of our more competitive colleges read colleges that have big amount of money that they're offering to students based on need will also ask for CSS profile in addition to FAFSA. That CSS profile gathers more information about our assets as a family um, so that they can determine need, you know, a little bit deeper than the FAFSA does um, and then award their money accordingly. So CSS profile is only for some students and families to complete if your colleges require that. If you're curious about that, Cam, again, we'll talk about this tomorrow night, but um, you can go to the college board, um, go to cssprofile.org, and there's a list of all the schools that require CSS profile. So the answer is yes, we will get into CSS profile, not quite as detailed as FAFSA, um, but we are here to help families answer any questions. We do not file CSS profiles with families only because it would take us hours um, and we just don't have the manpower to do that. But we can certainly try to answer as many questions as a family might have um, and, and get you pointed in the right direction if it's something we're not sure about. All right, that was all we have uh, for tonight. Amazing. Well, we want to give you back some time tonight. We appreciate you being with us and taking some time out of your really busy schedules. Uh, we know we're in Thanksgiving week and, and everybody's really busy. So thanks for, for hanging out with us, um, for getting those questions out there. They're great. Um, and I'm sure they helped other families who are listening in tonight as well. We did record this. We will get this up on our website. So if you know of somebody that might have missed tonight but wanted to join us, we'll get this up on our website within the next several days and we'll get you out all of the slides and all of the information um, as soon as tomorrow. So thank you for being here. Hope you all have a great night and a great Thanksgiving. Night.